It's been a while since the last video of the mobile development series, but I have great excuses for that. First of all, last month I was working on a Halloween special game that I successfully released the last week on Play Store. You play as Pumpkinhead, throwing pumpkins that explode on your enemies. But here's the catch, you don't have infinite pumpkins and on your journey you will find pumpkin seeds. These seeds can be planted in your farm and after a while, voila, you have more pumpkins to play with. The game is called Pumpkinhead's Halloween Farm and you can download it for free with the link in the description. Seeing a rating from you guys on the Play Store page would be awesome. Ok, enough with that, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done yet and let me jump into today's topic. As for now, we have our character with his walking animations and a script that handles our input through the move buttons. It's time to make our little Pokemon game prettier by creating tiles for the first tile set we are going to use. In Photoshop I have created two tiles, one simple ground tile and one with grass where Pokemon will spawn in the future. The square is 16 by 16 pixels and to have them all in one place I dragged them into a new file. The new one is 80 by 80 where 5 tiles can fit vertically and horizontally. Here is a great tip in Photoshop that if you didn't know about, well, it will change your life forever. Under preferences, click on guides, grids and slices. There under grid, change the number next to the grid line every to 16 or to any other number you are using for your art. You can even change the color the lines will have. If you still can't see the grid, you will need to enable it under show, grid. And boom, there it is, a very useful tip that will help you out in creating tilesets and other art for your game in Photoshop in case you don't have or can't use a sprite. Next I place the two tiles next to each other and save them in the sprite directory of my project. By saving the Photoshop file directly in Unity, you can jump back to Photoshop and make any changes you like, even if the sprites are already placed in your scene. Now in Unity select your tileset and in the inspector change the sprite mode to multiple. The pixels per unit should also be the same as each tile on your set, here 16. Since it is a PSD file, we will also remove matte. Have you ever noticed an annoying white outline around your sprites? Yeah, well that stays in the past. I also like to change the compression to RGBA 32 bit since this is a small image and I want it to be crystal clear. Open the sprite editor and click on slice. We don't want to do this automatically so we select grid by cell size, type in 16 by 16 and slice your bread in pieces. You can now see that our tiles are all cut out and available to use, beautiful. It's about time to create the tile map, right click on your hierarchy, 2D object and choose tile map. A new grid game object appeared with the tile map as a child. Now in order to draw on your tile map we need a new window. So go to window, 2D, tile palette. In this new window we want to create a new palette and name it palette 1. For that I always like to have a separate folder in my project. Ok the palette is created and we can now just drag and drop our tileset into it and let Unity do its magic. Save the new tileset wherever you like and it is ready to use. One thing I forgot is to change the filter mode of our sprite to point no filter since it's pixel art and we don't want it to appear blurry. Ok great, in the palette window you can now see a lot of tools that will help you out to draw on the grid. Simply select the brush tool and make sure that you are drawing on the right tile map. Here we have only one so we can do nothing wrong. Isn't it extremely easy to create a whole world just with this tool? Since I discovered it, it became my favorite thing to use and currently I'm learning how to create better tilesets for top down games like this or platformers like the Halloween game I created last month. Moving on, we have to adjust the sorting layer for the tile map and our character. Select the tile map and under sorting layer select add sorting layer. Here we name it ground 
and throw it behind the canvas layer since we want it to be rendered behind it. Ok, select the tile map again and assign the layer. Oops, now our character is behind the grass, looks like he's trying to hide from us. But no, we create a new layer for him that we will call character and assign it. Now the order goes ground, character, canvas and it's working great. Young Hercules, and in case you don't know, this game is based on Pokemon in the Greek region where the main protagonist is supposed to be Young Hercules, inspired by the Disney series Hercules. Ok, so Young Hercules can now have a walk around this beautiful park with some grass here and there and total darkness around it. I would like to just sit there and have a coffee as well. But let's get rid of the darkness. With the fill tool you can just select a huge area where you want the same type of tile and fill it in. Then with the brush tool you can now draw over it wherever you want. And just like this we have the first scene fully drawn. With that done we can move on in creating a tile based move system exactly like the old Pokemon or Zelda games used to have. This means that when clicking once at any button Hercules will move in that direction by exactly one tile. I love this kind of movement from the old games and I can still see a lot of potential in it especially in mobile gaming. So this is the character move script from the previous episode. Don't get disappointed but we will need to change things up to have an efficient grid movement. Let's start with a new private vector 3 variable that will be the final position we want to have our character on. In the update function we want things to happen only if we are not moving and that's why everything will go inside of this if statement. First of all let's take our movement x and movement y values together with the if statement that prevents diagonal movement. Next we also take the part where we check if our movement is different from zero but in there we don't need to check again if our character is walking so we delete it. The else statement can be deleted as well. The most crucial part is to set the new position and that's what we are going to do by adding to our current position a new vector 3 with the movement x and y values. Obviously 0 for the z axis. This line of code will increase or decrease by one or horizontal or vertical position. We also want to put in here the animator values for x and y and get rid of that walking equals true line. Have you ever used i enumerators? If yes, you will love it and if no, nah, follow along and let me know in the comments below if you want a video dedicated to timers and coroutines where I can make an in-depth tutorial about them. Ok, let's change the function type to an iNumerator that will have a parameter of type Vector3. Basically our new move2 position from before. To call the iNumerator it is necessary to use the start coroutine method and inside it the name of the iNumerator together with its parameters. In there we now set walking to true since as long as we are in this function our character is moving. This as long I just said translates into a while function. I made the mistake to use an if statement but that would turn Hercules into Quicksilver and you would have a Marvel Universe game. It's ok if you want that, really. I can see in your eyes that you are wondering why the hell I used Quicksilver as an example and not the famous DC superhero Flash. Nothing against Flash here but let's be honest. Never mind. Back to C sharp coding. In the while loop, we consistently check if the difference between the new position from our current position is greater than a very small number. To do that, we can use the squared magnitude of the subtraction and simply compare it to something small, for example 0.05. Or if we want to be extra fancy, we use mathf dot epsilon, which represents the smallest float value that is not zero. Pretty clever, isn't it? So, as long as these requirements are true, we will change the position of our character with the vector3 move towards method, where the first parameter is our current position and the second one the target position. As the third parameter, we use our move speed multiplicated with time.fixed delta time. Always, 
use fixed delta time instead of simply delta time when moving characters around. Now since it is an iNumerator, it needs to return something, in this case just null. After the while loop, we also need to make sure that Hercules has landed on the desired position on the grid and to achieve this, we manually set its position to the new position. Doing so, we prevent even the smallest problem in our grid movement. Finally, we set walking to false and the coroutine is ready. The very last thing in here is to set the animator bool variable to the right value outside of the if statement and instead of true, we use the walking boolean. Done, nothing more to see here. It works perfectly and you can change the move speed in the inspector as you like. For my preferences, I would stick to one since the results are what I'm looking for in such a game. And that's it for today's video. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't done so and if you want to learn more about animating or mobile development, click on these videos on your screen and I'll see you next time. Ciao!